Hello, this is the Shackleton Beckwith uh, duo, Shackleton the Explorer, and uh, I'm Paul Beckwith. In Ottawa, as I'm filming this video, just looking out the window, and we're having a massive uh, snowstorm. Lots of lots and lots of snow. Um, I cleared some snow off one of my flat roofs, um, and uh, I measured the uh, snow depth, and it was uh, about 19, 20 inches. Um, and that's just in the last, uh, month, I guess. Anyway, um, in this video and series of videos, I'm going to be talking all about the interconnections in the Arctic. And I'm actually quite excited about, uh, one paper, recent paper that I find is the most significant in a long, long time. And that is that, believe it or not, the Arctic Ocean was completely fresh water at two different intervals in the last 150,000 years. First one about a hundred and about 130 to 150,000 years ago and the other interval more recently 60 to 70,000 years ago. In those cases we had very harsh ice, ice uh, ages, ice coverage of the Arctic. It was extremely cold. Um, so it was a glacial period with extreme glacial ice. And what happened is, is the sea levels would be, were 130 meters lower. Okay, if you convert that to feet, that's about multiplied by 3.3. So that's 390 plus 39, about 420 feet lower. Okay, so what that meant is that there was no connection of the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean because the Bering Strait was, the, the sea level was so low that, the, that you had a land bridge, Beringia, the Bering Strait was completely landlocked, okay, a, a bridge there. And also the Canadian Archipelago Islands were also completely um, blocked up. Now, over on the Atlantic side, there's two kind of choke points, which I'll show you. And it turns out that the choke point, the southernmost choke point, the, if you take the, a path from Greenland to Scotland, okay, there's very, very shallow water over a lot of that region. And there's some deeper areas, but the basically with 130 meter lower sea level, the shallower areas were all land. And so there were only a couple small channels um, where, where water could transfer between the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic. Okay, but the thing is, is we had tremendous ice shells. Um, we had tremendous uh, glaciers on, on Greenland and, and uh, basically uh, Northern Europe. And these uh, ice shells, the ice was as much as 900 meters thick. Now, if that ice is over water and floating, of course, 10% or about 90 meters is above the surface. And that would leave about over 800 meters below the surface. So combine 130 meters lower sea level with ice, thick ice, shelves that extend downwards 800 meters into the water and we're talking about eight so 800 meters plus the 130 meter lower sea level rise that's about almost almost nine, 930 or almost a kilometer um, below the present level so any any um, ocean regions so in order for there still to be an open channel it would have to be at least a kilometer down from what we have today and if you take a kilometer down over that region from Greenland to Scotland, that doesn't leave much space for transfer of water from the Arctic to the Atlantic. Okay, so what that means is, well, there were still lots of freshwater sources in the Arctic. So rain, snow melting, any ice melting, the, all the rivers that feed fresh water into the Arctic Ocean. Okay, all of those things were still operating, so there was still a lot of, of freshwater source up to, I think, 1,200 cubic kilometers 
uh, each each year. So, so meanwhile, so that what that water just builds up, and so not only was all the wa fresh water stored in the ice in the Arctic, but it was stored in liquid form under the ice under the sea ice. Okay, so and how far would it extend down? It could extend down almost a kilometer. And that water, that fresh water input would then force out the salty water that was left. So essentially the whole Arctic Ocean was fresh water. And this is a huge result. This is a huge finding and this is completely new and novel. I was very close to determining that a couple of years ago, but I didn't pursue it to the last step. But often in climate simulations of abrupt weather events like the Dansgaard Osher oscillations, um, these abrupt change events, um, often they're simulated by doing what's called water hosing experiments where you, 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 you have a huge amount of fresh water released from the Arctic Ocean. So how quickly does it go south and how does it affect the climate? So there's lots of studies on that. But there was always, in order for to explain the abrupt transitions, like for example, on, on Greenland, where the temperature goes from the cold, which is, you know, the ice ages are typically at least five degrees Celsius warmer or colder than today's average temperature. So five degree average temperature lower. And the temperatures would, on Greenland ice cores indicated that a temperature rise of five to eight degree, five to 10 degrees um, in a matter of a decade or two and then taking hundreds to thousand years to, to cool back down. And the spikes, temperature spikes on Greenland were as high as 16 and a half degrees. Okay, this abrupt changes. And it, for those sort of things to happen, freshwater release would do it from the Arctic, but the volumes were nowhere near close enough just from, but now that we know that the, almost the entire Arctic Ocean was fresh water in these time periods, that completely changes the ball game. It's a huge, it's a huge result and it's a very surprising result, but you know, it's pretty obvious when you, when you look at the papers. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of the connections of the Arctic. You know, that's the key finding, that's the most significant finding. And it explains a lot in the paleo records. And this paper just uh, came out um, this month about three weeks ago. Okay, so let me get to the uh, nitty gritty and I'll also go over the actual uh, papers. But before I do that, um, I just wanna talk about a couple a couple other things. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about some of the books. Uh, I've always got a Stephen King on the go. Um, I'm up to, I've read about 15 or so in the last few months and this is my most recent one. Uh, Sleeping Beauties, uh, published in 2017. And it's interesting because he's a co-author with his son. And it's a really interesting story. I, I highly recommend it. No spoilers. Um, in terms of other books, some non-climate, well, generally non-climate interest. You know, The Case for Mars was published a while ago. I don't know, 20 years ago. It's got some up 25th anniversary edition. It's the plan to settle the red planet and why we must. So it's a fascinating read. I've always thought if we went to other planets to settle, you know, or other places, the moon would be a good start and then the moon could be a stepping point to to Mars. But um, anyway, this I'll let you know about, about why the argument's in here. And then on a climate front, of course, I've got the Bill Gates book. You know, it's controversial to people, um, you know, in climate change, you know, what can Bill Gates do or say? So anyway, I'll let you know from reading this book. And of course, uh, the Michael Mann book, The New Climate War, um, that's also on my list. And then a book that was published a little while ago, uh, Six Degrees of Climate Emergency. So th this was Mark Linus, um, originally published a book um, years ago, and this is an update, our final warning. Um, six oh, six degrees, our future on a hotter planet. That was a while ago, and this is sort of six degrees of climate emergency. So what happens with, a, with uh, each of those uh, temperature rises from one degree up to six degree? And also, it's been a tough couple of weeks on a personal front. 
I was skating on the, my wife was skating on the canal and she fell and, and, and broke her wrist and, uh, you know, on her right hand. So, um, and then that was about two weeks ago. And then, a, and then a, a few days ago, she had an oper operation to put in a plate and to get it all set up. So, you know, it's always a bit stressful when somebody, you know, the, the, your, your main love um, gets injured like that. It, it makes you think, especially, you know, me studying climate and, you know, how it's getting worse and worse and worse and the existential risks to humanity. And then also with the COVID. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of us feel the stress from, because we can't, we don't have control over things. So it's really important to compartmentalize and focus what you have control over and take actions towards, um, you know, having a sort of mission, mission ideas, mission statement, you know, but also always recognizing what you can do and what you have no control over. Those are the key to staying, having a stable uh, mental uh, situation. Okay, so I've talked a bit longer than I thought, but this is, okay, so let's get right down to the, uh, general press on what's happening, the connections of the climate system, and then the peer-reviewed papers. So over over a series of videos. So um, I talked recently about Arctic temperature amplification, how it influences the polar vortex, causing severe winter weather, and how it was directly related to the to the huge. Um, cold temperatures and snow in Texas and knocked out a third of the power grid, 4.5 million Texas households and extended cold and darkness, you know, and then, you know, it dominated the news last week. And then this week it's all forgotten, you know, <laughs> but it has severe, huge impact on all of these people's lives. So more and more people are being affected by climate change. So please check out my website, paulbeckwith.net and consider donating to PayPal. I rely entirely on donations through PayPal and I need to set up a Patreon account and try to figure out how to, if people want to donate by Bitcoin and all these other things. But my, the business aspect, if you like, of my work is the, the, the worst area, the, the area I pay least attention to. So I probably should have some help on that, those sort of things. Okay, so, and of course my YouTube channel you just Google Paul H. Beck with YouTube um, and you can search. I've got oh, well over a thousand videos now. Um, okay, so uh, have a check that out. Um, this is on my Facebook page. A um, couple things is the, the high probability ocean tipping points, okay, which I'm talking about. The Atlantic Ocean circulation is at the weakest in a millennium, 15% lower. It could go 30 to 50% lower and and that's related to um the changes in the arctic the fresh water being released okay um you know freshwater fish we don't talk too much about that but they're in catastrophic design this is a brilliant old house it was built in 1524 there you go i'd, I'd love to have a house like that my house is 120 years old. It's 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 a newbie compared to to this guy. So lots of stuff on on Facebook, um, Twitter. I always pin the uh, latest videos. Um, this is really amazing. I got to show you this. Okay, this is the distribution of solar energy on the planet. So it goes cycles through by date. So bright daylight is the yellow. Okay, so you can get your latitude. I'm Ottawa is 45 degrees north. So at any given day, you can see how much of the twilight of low daylight, medium daylight, then there's bright daylight, and then the twilights. Okay, so this is in the mornings, right? This is the time, the hour. Okay, so this is the morning light, and then this is the evening twilight, these transition zones, and then dark and light. So a couple interesting things. If you're at the North Pole, it's completely dark north of about 78 degrees, you know, for a period of time, of course. And it's 24 hours of bright sunlight uh, at other times. 
okay and uh you know you can so you can pick anywhere you are this is a fascinating depiction of uh 